The Kenya Human Rights Commission, the Katiba Institute, the British Institute for Eastern Africa, and the Judicial Training Institute organize an international conference on the interpretation and shaping of a transformative constitution, which was held in Nairobi from 9th to 11th June 2014. We're grateful for the privilege of participating in this conference and look forward to a robust engagement with all of you who have taken the time to be here over the next three days. Karibuni, welcome. Asanteni sana. The purpose of the conference was to assist the legal community in Kenya, as well as politicians, civil society leaders and journalists, to reflect on what is involved in the interpretation of the new constitution promulgated on 27th August 2014. The constitution marked an almost complete break with the previous system of governance and as a result is described as a transformative constitution. I think transformative constitutions uh, uh, are somewhat different from the previous constitutions, uh, uh, classical kind of constitutions, because of the emphasis placed on values and objectives of the constitution. The constitution has developed a vision for Kenya's future. This vision is based on a set of values which are explicitly and some repeatedly stated and made the basis of governance. The conference brought together eminent judges and scholars from several countries which have adopted transformative constitutions. The first two days were devoted to presentations on interpretation by some of these judges and academics and also others from East Africa. The primary objective of the conference was for Kenyans to learn about the experience of the courts in interpreting and shaping the development of constitutions in other countries. One of these constitutions included India, with its innovative and radical independence constitution. The specific session was led by Professor M.P. Singh, Vice-Chancellor of the National University of Juridical Sciences in Kolkata. A special position was assigned to the judiciary in the constitution. Uh, it was uh, not very clearly stated as it has been done under the, in the, under the constitution of Kenya, but the intention was very clear that the transformative character of the constitution will actually be realized only through an independent and competent juris, uh, judiciary. In Kenya, uh, the, the government has shown great contempt for the orders uh, given by the, by the court. I, I, I expect this has been a problem in India too. At that time, when court was also uh, starting new jurisprudence, uh, the court would normally confront the Attorney General that uh, do you think uh, this is proper on the part of the state not to do this? And uh, the Attorney General would normally uh, agree. He, he could not say that uh, no, the government's stand is this. Judges in, the, uh, in Kenya have to actually uh, look into the kind of uh, methods uh, the judges uh, in India have used since uh, mid-1970s. Kenyan courts have relied heavily on South African decisions as our constitution draws considerably on the South African constitution. Justice Albi Sachs, former justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, handled the third session on South Africa's experience in relation to the demolition of apartheid and the commitment to a non-racial society. I remember when we started the new Constitutional Court in South Africa, some of us had been in prison, we'd been in the resistance in the underground, others had been judges during apartheid, others had defended Mandela in his treason trials, some were deeply religious, others were emphatically secular. Some came from very privileged backgrounds. Others had suffered all the indignities imposed upon the great majority of South Africans. Did you face situations where there were attempts by people who didn't come from excluded groups to, in a sense, use affirmative provisions? You don't use affirmative action to enrich your brother-in-law and your cousin and your friend and the guy you went to school with or even the person you worship with on Sunday. 
Uh, that's not appropriate forms of affirmative action, even if it does involve distribution from an advantaged group to a disadvantaged group. It's got to be done in a principled way. We don't feel we're issuing instructions to government. Uh, we are in dialogue with government, uh, with the legislature, and uh, when it comes to laws that are struck down as inconsistent with the Constitution, we suspend frequently the inconstitutionality uh, decision to give Parliament a chance to rectify the defect. The Canadian experience followed shortly, handled by the supernumerary judge, Court of Appeal of Ontario, Justice Robert Sharp. He expounded on the adoption of human rights as an integral part of the Canadian constitutional order. What the court is asked to do is to, is to balance. Balance, the, if it may be competing rights, it may be a, uh, the right of expression to be balanced against the right of equality. Let's say if it's a case about hate speech. Uh, it might be balancing the right of the individual right against the general social interest. The courts will often give the legislature a, what I'd call a way out. In other words, they, the court says this law does not pass muster. But if you adopt a, a different law, one that is less intrusive of this right and freedom, one that is more minimally invasive of the, protect, the constitutionally protected right. My understanding of uh, the processes which some countries go through to come up with a constitution is that you invite views of the population. And then after that, the commission which went around the country, collected views, came up with a report. The report was presented before Parliament, which discussed each article and then came up with a final. In my view, I wouldn't... The fifth session, Dr. Matthias Hartwig from the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Law and International Law shared the German experience. He touched on how the transformative nature of their constitution saw it break from the Nazi regime after the Second World War and became based on a strong commitment to democracy and human rights. The European Convention in a, and the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in a way are included into the constitutional law of Germany. This is a very important step. This is a very important step. And here I just would my, like to make an appeal, if I may uh, do so. Try to do the same here in Africa. There should be an interplay between the national constitutional courts and the, uh, uh, and the African court uh, in order to invigorate uh, fundamental rights. You, you mentioned that uh, judges are bound to follow uh, international law. I'm curious what is the hierarchy of international law in Germany and tied to that, what happens uh, where there is a conflict between uh, the constitution of Germany and international law, especially on contentious issues? According to the hierarchy of norms, the constitutional norm is, uh, uh, is the supreme law of the land. Courts have to take into consideration uh, the reasoning of the European Court, and if they want to deviate, they must give good reasons. Otherwise, it will end up in another violation of our constitution. The speaker of the sixth session was Justice Kamal Bukhari, non-permanent judge of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. His presentation was on the Hong Kong experience, which has a strong regime for human rights and the new basic law which serves as an instrument on domestic common law in Hong Kong. Our judiciary is empowered and duty-bound to strike down any common law rule, legislation or executive order that cannot be read in conformity with the basic law. When I heard your presentation, which again I said was a wonderful presentation, I was left wondering how does this dialogue take place? How do we move to, for example, making sure that people um, have social and economic rights when we do not have very good sources of money? Not enough money, yes, that is a problem. And when it comes to the distribution and allocation resources, there is the problem. Sometimes a country has more money than uh, it says to the people. Uh, as Lord Desai said not long time ago, uh, throughout Asia, uh, and indeed in Africa, uh, there is a very close association uh, between governments and big business. And sometimes I rather think government is a big business. The United Kingdom experience was presented on the seventh session by Professor Jeffrey Joel, a director at the Bingham Center 
on the rule of law. There is another very important constitution or principle, which is the rule of law. And the rule of law is increasingly, and I say this not only because I direct the Bingham Center for the rule of law, uh, but because I passionately believe that it is a constitutional principle that is probably as high or higher than any of the others. It is something that supports and enhances the dignity of individuals absolutely everywhere. I'd like to find out how the United King Kingdom has provided legislation or how has it balanced human rights and uh, uh, the legitimate objective of government of trying to prevent terrorism? Uh, the government initially introduced a law which allowed almost indefinite detention only for people without British nationality. It was not proportionate to the, to the risk, um, indefinite terrorism. So the government then took down the period of detention from 42 to 28 days, a kind of control order, it was called, house arrest, secret trials, all sorts of uh, issues were tried. Each of them was challenged in the courts and in parliament, and all of them are subject to challenge in the, uh, before the European Court of Human Rights as well. So although it is agreed that terrorism must be challenged, that the police have to have a degree of free hand, the notion of proportionality comes into all this for reasons that I mentioned earlier. This was followed by constitutional remedies by Professor Kent Roach from the School of Law in the University of Toronto. Remedies are united by a big idea. Remedies make things better, they put things right, they allow us to mend our wounds and carry on as individuals and society. Uh, and I very much agree with those, those, uh, those statements. The last session of the second day was devoted to recaps and reflections on the two days' deliberations. Yesterday's presentations uh, addressed the need for the three arms of government uh, to relate to a constitution. But the point I want to make here is we leave a very important segment that nurtures a constitution in terms of its resilience out of this process. And that is people themselves. The constitution is given to the people by the people in their own language. Do the judges speak the language of the people? No. How do we engage these people? The first session of the third day saw Honorable Joseph Warioba, former Prime Minister of Tanzania, and Chairperson of the Constitutional Review Commission of Tanzania, speak on Tanzania's quest for a new constitution. In 1992, multi-party politics uh, was re-established. In 2010, the president announced that he was going to start a process towards getting a new constitution. So we have included national views, national values <coughs> in the constitution. We are also very strong on integrity. Some of the political parties were not amused at all. And they didn't want the, uh, the, con the commission to continue with the mandate they had. So they went back to parliament and changed the law. This was followed by East African scholars, particularly young scholars presenting papers on constitutional issues at the national and regional level. Or will we have to go again and start interpreting these national principles and values? Because then if there's an, uh, an interpretational problem with the national principles and values themselves, then we also have to go back to these principles, to these values, and start the process of interpreting them. We have a new constitution, very well celebrated. For the first time, we have human rights within our constitution. I know that if we want to bring real change in a country, if we want to bring real change in a society, then we have to interrogate and ask ourselves what are our national values and principles. The judges and senior scholars who attended were able to give comments and suggestions to the papers presented. The 13th session 
the last session of the conference, the speaker was Professor Jeffrey Joel, who gave a presentation on creative tension, administrative justice versus freedom to govern in the UK. We've also learned that constitutions are not foolproof guarantees of those values. But without them, there's little hope of achieving those values and they provide the necessary framework. And they must not only be bits of paper, there are a number of countries in the world that celebrate their new constitution. They drink to their, to their existence. They throw the little shots of vodka over their shoulder with the constitution. The process is over. We never see any implementation again. The three-day conference succeeded in bringing together an exceptional team of eminent jurists. Despite the different challenges faced in implementing transformative constitutions, the eminent scholars provided insight that was beneficial and rekindled optimism and commitment from participants in advancing transformative constitutionalism in their countries around the world. This conference has actually uh, reinforced my my will to stay on and uh, uh, work for the transformation of this country. <laughs>